mind control through a definite chief aim. So you may have heard of me talk about before the concept called definite chief aim, which was coined by Napoleon Hill. The idea that everything in your life evolves around a definite chief aim, and the goal is to identify what that definite chief aim is, and make a commitment to yourself that you're going to do everything that you can and keep your attention and your awareness on that what is related towards your definite chief aim. Now, why would you want to do something like this? Well, the first thing that happens is this is the way to go about applying the principles and thinking grow rich and just about any success philosophy. And this is how you create success by keeping your mind on what is important to you. The second thing that happens, which in my opinion is the most important, is that you could take control of your mind. We live in a world where a lot of us are at the whim of the external world. We allow the world to tell us what we want and should not want. And as a result of this, we form a false sense of identity. We let the noise of other people's opinions, and sometimes they're valid and sometimes they're not valid. But a lot of times we unconsciously and unknowingly form an identity about ourselves, which is buried deep called our self image. And we navigate reality from this perspective which may or may not be in alignment with our true identity, which is our vision. I believe we're born into this world to realize our vision. Everything that you want in life is available for you, and it is received through the process of living a purposeful and meaningful life. One that is in the spirit of harmony, benefit for you, benefit for others that you serve, and benefit for divine or evolution. That's what we're talking about when we say vision. Everybody has the ability to identify what their vision is. Some over the course of their life might be able to identify what it is, and some will not. But the question remains is, do you want to identify your vision? See, when I started on this journey, my definite chief aim when I learned this from Think and Grow Rich, was to get out of $50,000 debt. That was my definite chief aim. I got out of the $50,000 debt in a few years, and I realized the definite chief aim. It became true. And what was also important was who I became in the journey. My self-confidence went up. I learned various important skills. I started to develop the ability to work with reprogramming my subconscious mind. And I used what I learned over there to set another definite chief aim and achieve that definite chief aim. And again, repeating the process, I grew as a person. So life is set up in a very interesting way. You're here to identify what your vision is and realize it more and more by setting a definite chief aim. So set a goal, achieve the goal, and tap into the power. Now I'm going to talk about this power in a moment. And I've pulled various quotes from Neville Goddard, Napoleon Hill, who coined the term definite chief aim, and James Allen to really get deep into this discussion. So Neville Goddard refers to the word power by the following quote here, which is from his discussion, Power. And I did a discussion on that video. I'll put a link in the description. He says, I do not mean the power of Caesar. I'm speaking tonight of the power of God. For here in the world of Caesar, I think all nations would admit that this land of ours is by far the greatest power in the world of Caesar, economic power and military power. I'm speaking of the power of God, which is called in scripture, Jesus Christ. Paul defines Christ as the power of God and the wisdom of God. Here we find wisdom and power exalted and personified as God's companion in the creation of the world. That power is your own wonderful human imagination. You are created in the image of the creator and you have the power to create. And so you're being taught to create by working in your imagination. How you believe reality to be, what you imagine reality is, is going to materialize as the external world in people, environment, and circumstance to reveal what is within yourself in your imagination. And the goal here is to identify your true vision hold that in your imagination and realize that you are supported by 
the power of your imagination to bring it forth. Some way, somehow, it will be brought forth. Your goal is to hold in your mind that what you desire. What is your vision? And your vision gets uncovered along the journey. It becomes clearer and more vivid. I'll speak from experience in this. It may start with one thing, but it's that one thing that when you put it to use and you use the power of your imagination and you keep your mind on that what is related to your vision, that will eventually reveal to you this power of your imagination as you experience in the external world it materializing into form. It will become so. The man who can fix within his own mind's eye an idea, even though the world would deny it, if he remains faithful to that idea, he will see it manifested. There is all the difference in the world between holding the idea and being held by the idea. Become so dominated by an idea that it haunts the mind as though you were it. Then, regardless what others may see or say, you are walking in the direction of your fixed attitude of mind. You are walking in the direction of the idea that dominates your mind. Now, Neville is talking about the definite chief aim here. The definite chief aim is that what you desire, what you want to hold in your mind that is part of the vision, the reason why you are here. And it could be the totality of the vision or it could be one specific thing that you are going to bring forth that will lead you to a deeper understanding of what your vision is. You will accomplish that what you put your mind to if you hold in your mind's eye your definite chief aim. Now, in one of his discussions, he talks about this concept called assumptions hardening into fact. The state I seek to embody is personified in the story as Jesus the Savior. If I become what I want to be, then I am saved from what I was. If I do not become it, I continue to keep locked within me a thief who robs me of being that which I could be. So what robs you is within, and who is this thief? This thief is fears, doubts, and indecision. It was covered in Think and Grow Rich, outwitting the six ghosts of fear section. All those fears, those doubts, and indecisions are programmings that you had learned from this world. And some of it's even wired in our neurology. The goal of this life is to release those fears, doubts, and indecision if they do not serve us so that we can honor our vision, so we could live in faith in our vision, and we can believe and hold in our mind the imaginary act as fact in our mind till that assumption of the imaginary fact in our imagination hardens into fact by materializing as its equivalent in the external world. And we can do this to the definite chief aim. Now I'm going to identify a process of going about creating a definite chief aim that I use. And over the years of working with a definite chief aim, I've evolved it to make it even more powerful, which I want to share with you. If we are wise, we too should clamor for the release of that state of mind that limits us from being what we want to be, that restricts us, that does not permit us to become the ideal that we seek and strive to attain in this world. Release the state of mind that limits us. The outer world is a projection of the state of mind within, and by releasing the state of mind that we do not desire, the external world evolves and changes and adjusts to reflect the state of mind that we do desire. Releasing is the letting go, and the letting go is bound, binding us in our mind. It exists in our mind. And it is a net result of what is in our subconscious mind, what I find. Subconscious programming that has been instilled through past experiences, usually fear-based, that causes us to recreate in reality the same scenario over and over again through the same people or different people, environment, and circumstance. What is being created in the external world is revealing to us about ourselves. I'm going to bring up some quotes from James Allen's As a Man Thinketh to discuss this further. Why? Because the power of your imagination wants to bring forth your imagination-based true identity, which is your vision. So the way this works is the external world reveals to you about yourself, and you can tell within you if it's in alignment with your true vision or not by how you feel. If you materialize something or reflect something in the external world and you don't feel good about it, then it is not in alignment with the vision. And we have to ask ourselves, where does this come from? 
The goal is to identify where it comes from and then go to work on it by releasing it via subconscious mind reprogramming, by holding in our mind that what we desire in our imagination and allowing the power of the superconscious mind or infinite intelligence to do its thing to materialize the external world into form. See, we've got the conscious mind, we've got the subconscious mind, and we've got the superconscious. The superconscious mind is the infinite intelligence, the imagination depths, the power of God. And the subconscious mind is the connection to that. And the conscious mind is the guardian of the subconscious mind. Information has gone into the subconscious mind and programmed either from an empowering or disempowering perspective. If it has been programmed from a disempowering perspective, it has probably broken the connection to the superconscious, the power of our imagination. And so what we have to do is release that programming by first identifying that programming as it is being expressed outwards automatically by circumstance, people, and environment, taking inventory of that and realizing that the cause is within. And then going and adjusting the cause within, we start to notice that the external world changes. We do affirmations. I made a video on affirmations, the last video, I recommend you watch it. We do things like timeline regression to go back and heal aspects of our past. We do things like visualization and also consciously placing ourselves in environments, people, circumstance that uplift, nurture, and raise us up to a state of empowerment by consuming that information. That kind of information goes into the subconscious mind to again reveal to us what is within our subconscious mind so we can change it. It also goes into our subconscious mind and reprograms the subconscious mind. So what is a materialization or a projection from within the subconscious mind is that what is harmonious to what we desire. So that is what is to be said about releasing the state of mind. It's to ask ourselves, are we experiencing states of mind that are in from a place of fear, doubt, and indecision? And to realize that that is not our true identity. That is a false sense of identity that we have learned through the external world via our five senses. And we can question that and we can release it. And when we release it, we allow ourselves to build a deeper connection with our subconscious mind and the superconscious. And we have more faith in the superconscious and the subconscious. And we'll notice that we'll carry ourselves with a higher degree of confidence. What you'll also start to notice is that interestingly enough, circumstance, people, and environment all of a sudden look like they're contributing to that what is related towards your definite chief aim. And they're actually helping you bring it forth. You'll also notice that you'll be doing the things and thinking the things and talking the things that are in alignment from a place of empowerment. This information will further program your subconscious mind and project outwards and materialize into form until those assumptions, the way of thinking, the mental states, those state of minds harden into fact by what you see and what you experience in the external world, which is the manifestation or materialization of your definite chief aim. And then when you do this over and over again with the next definite chief aim, you identify more elements within the subconscious mind that needs to be reprogrammed and you repeat this process over and over again. This is to be said of how to live a meaningful life. The best way to do this is to concentrate your attention upon the idea, identifying yourself with your ideal. Assume you are already that which you seek and your assumption, though false, if sustained, will harden into fact. See, in order to do this, you have to have the confidence and faith and belief in yourself that the vision that you hold in your mind, when you realize it is you, it will be so. And that will allow you to work with the power of your imagination. So how does the imagination work? Well, that's considered the power of God. And we don't even need to know how it works, but it will be so. A lot of people who created success don't know how they went about doing it. They just knew that they were going to do it. And then after they created, they can connect the dots looking backwards, as Steve Jobs said. A lot of the things that I've created in my life, I had no clue or no idea how I was going to do it. I might have had a rough plan, but the way it materialized, the way the success happened is some way that I never thought possible because I had faith and I trusted the power of my subconscious mind to tap into infinite intelligence and the superconscious mind to bring it forth. So what I'm saying here and what Neville Goddard talks about is that we can allow the imagination to do its thing, which is called the power of God. That is what he's talking about. Allow it whatever way, if it's not explainable, to do its thing and test it and see that it is so. I've done this many times and proven it to be true. Now, assumptions harden into fact. If you do not believe it's possible, then remember this one important quote. As you believe, so it shall be done unto you. 
The external world is a materialization of, a reflection of the beliefs within of how we believe reality to work. And if you are adamant of reality being a certain way, you will always find proof that it is that way. And if you believe it to be another way, you'll find proof that it is that way. So in the Kabbalion, we say everything is and isn't at the same time. So to one individual, they create success by using X. The other one, they create success by using Y. It is as they believe the thoughts within that drive whether they choose X or Y. So you have the ability now to be open-minded and allow that X or Y be chosen for you by just assuming in your mind that it will be so and observe as reality starts to shift, your behavior starts to change and everything starts to change to materialize and reflect accordingly. And if in the process you doubt, then there are things that we can do, which I'm going to talk about of how I overcome fears, doubts, and indecision in the process between choosing the definite chief aim and bringing it forth. We always seem to under to others the embodiment of the ideal we inspire. Therefore, in meditation, we must imagine that others see us as they would see us were we what we desire to be. So what you want to do is you want to see yourself that way and you want to remove in your mind any kinds of doubts of other people seeing you contrarian to that. See, because all is actually one mind. This is one mind individualized. And the mind, the one mind, is a superconscious mind. And we have access to the superconscious mind via the subconscious mind. We are all one mind. We are all one. We're individual and we are one. Everything is and isn't at the same time. You have to learn how to embrace that. So while you have the ability to be an individual, you also have the ability to navigate reality as a whole with all beings. And that is done by holding in your imagination how you want to see yourself and even in your imagination how others are going to see you. So you can't hold in your imagination that you see yourself a certain way and then imagine others to see you as the opposite because you're creating that to be so and it'll be reflected to be so. But to the degree that you can self-persuade yourself that you are a certain way and others see you that way, it will become so because you're removing the fears, doubts, and indecision. The outer world is a reflection of the inner world. So if you believe that you see yourself a certain way and others don't see you that way, then what you will materialize in the external world is revelations of you seeing yourself that way and others not seeing yourself that way. You're essentially creating a separation. So the goal is to bring everyone in the spirit of harmony, which, by the way, is the main element of the superconscious mind. The superconscious mind operates from the spirit of harmony, benefit for you, benefit for others, and benefit for divine or evolution. When a person discovers their true vision, it is actually what others want for them. It is actually what they want because you discovering your true vision and you bring it in, into existence is actually benefiting others. That's why a lot of people who create success using process like this eventually go on to help create success in the lives of others. They learn how to do it. They materialize it. They create the results and then they go and teach others. What happens is all is one mind and individualized, and the person that believes reality to be the most makes it so. And if you want the superconscious on your side, make reality be from a place of abundance consciousness, which is win, win, win. If you rise up to that level of thought, what happens is then the information goes into the subconscious mind of the others, and they will start to realize that in some way, somehow, you don't even have to think about how it's going to happen. It will be so because it is in the spirit of harmony for all. You're not doing it to take away from another person. You're doing it to create abundance through all. You're saying that through your definite chief aim, you are creating what you want. And also, it is a net result of helping others create what they want. So all operates in one mind at a higher consciousness-based, superconscious level to materialize the dreams for all. So what does Napoleon Hill have to say about the definite chief aim? Any definite chief aim that is deliberately fixed in the mind and held there with the determination to realize it, finally saturates the entire subconscious mind until it automatically influences the physical action of the body towards the attainment of that purpose. So you have to saturate the mind with the definite chief aim, and I've got a process for doing it. So when I create my definite chief aim, my latest iteration of making this work, is I reflect back on all the areas of my life and I see them all harmonious with each other. Every area of my life, from relationships, friendships, fitness, whatever, is related to my definite chief aim. I am able to identify 
why and how it is. And my definite chief aim is related to the other areas of my life. Because I look at everything as one. So everything is contributing towards moving towards your vision. Nothing or no one gets neglected. Everyone is part of it. So we're combining, imagining in your mind that everyone and everything is there harmoniously with you to support you towards your vision, including all the areas of your life that you are part of every single day. People, environment, and circumstance, and the various things that you do in all the areas of your life are contributing towards your definite chief aim. So when you're doing something, you're always looking and seeing how is this related to your definite chief aim. And you're able to see if it's important to you how it is related to your definite chief aim. By doing that, you form the connections in your brain, the neural pathways that link everything, association, neural association. And you're motivated to do that thing. You've got your time, your energy, your resources, and your opportunity costs, your wisdom, knowing the difference. If you saturate yourself with everything in your entire day to be related towards your definite chief aim by knowing with absolute fa faith and conviction that it is related to your definite chief aim, then you will value everything and everyone in your life. Now, I like to take this a step further, and I like to find seven different reasons why everything in my life is contributing towards my definite chief aim. It's worth it to sit down and take inventory of the important areas of your life and link it towards your definite chief aim. If you don't link it to your definite chief aim and you don't see the connect of how it's related to your definite chief aim, you might have a deeper sense of resentment or anger towards doing something else by not seeing it as related to your definite chief aim, and then you won't experience flow. See, flow is a state we want to be in, which you know traditionally defined flow means challenge means skill. But I take it a step further and say flow is a feeling in which you experience a certain kind of bliss in which you know you're doing what you love to do, what the world needs, what you can get paid for, and what you're good at. And you also know that flow is found in all areas of your life. And you're able to find flow in all areas of your life by asking yourself with everything you do, how can I find flow in it? If you understand how flow works, and I recommend watch my video on flow by Mihai Chik sent me, I'm really studying flow, then you can create flow in everything. And then by knowing that everything is related towards your definite chief aim, you're able to find flow in each of those things related to your definite chief aim, even walking down the street, even doing the dishes, even doing the administration work. If it's a business you want to create and there's a net result of number that you want to create, then everything in your life is contributing towards creating that number. And if you find the connects, then you will value each of those areas of your life. And each of those areas of your life will teach you how to bring forth your vision. And it will, from a physical standpoint, emotional standpoint, mental standpoint, keep your mind fixated on the definite chief aim. And that's how you control your mind. When you realize that everything is related to your definite chief aim and you commit to saturating your mind, saturating your environment, saturating your time, your energy, your resources, with that what is related to your definite chief aim, you have control of your mind. And when you have control of your mind, that energy goes and impresses itself on the subconscious mind and the subconscious mind from a place of flow, not from a place of force, brings the vision, vision forward, and that's how you get control of your mind. Your definite chief aim in life should be selected with deliberate care. And after it has been selected, it should be written out and placed where you see it at least once a day. The psychological effect of which it is to impress this purpose upon your subconscious mind so strongly that it accepts the purpose as a pattern or blueprint that will eventually dominate your activities in life and lead you step by step through the attainment of the object back of that purpose. So what do I do? I keep a card with me in which I write my definite chief aim. And I've always done that. And I've always brought forth every definite chief aim that I've written on a card since 2004. And what I've realized is this definite chief aim that I write in my card, which I also borrowed some principles from The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale to help me write this card, has always reoriented my focus. Anytime I find myself getting distracted or getting thrown off my definite chief aim as far as saturating my mind, I pick up the card and I read it and right away, right then and there, my mind goes back on my definite chief aim. And then I start to see reality as harmonious and related to my definite chief aim. Now all of a sudden, I am embracing and accepting an understanding of all people, environment and circumstance. If you don't do something like this and your mind wanders, you might find yourself resentful 
towards people, environment, and circumstance, or angry towards. But it's not them. It's the anger within of not honoring yourself that is reflected outwards in the people, environment, and circumstance. So it's not them. It's you. But when you keep your mind fixated on that what is related to your definite chief aim or your definite chief aim, you control your mind, you feel in control, and you realize that nobody has control over you. And your outer world becomes a reflection of it accordingly. Until a man selects a definite purpose in life, he dissipates his energies and spreads his thoughts over many subjects and in so many different directions that they lead not to power but to indecision and weakness. So we're talking about the power here, the power being your imagination, that what is in your mind, that what you think about all day long, that what you visualize, that what you focus on. And by keeping your attention on that, by keeping your focus on what is related to your vision and your imagination in a way that is related to your vision, you take the power back. And by allowing your energy and your attention to drift onto things that are not related, you give the power away, which lowers your self-confidence. See, one of the ways to bring everything forth is to raise up your self-confidence. In order to raise your self-confidence, you have to feel self-confidence. You cannot lie to yourself when it comes to self-confidence. I did a whole video on the self-confidence formula. I recommend you watch it. Put a link in the description. But one of the fastest ways and best and most effective ways to increase your self-confidence is to keep your mind on your vision. That's how you know you have control of your reality. That's how you start to see everything in the world harmonized towards that vision. And that's where you start to believe and trust yourself. That's where you listen to your inner voice, which comes from the superconscious and the subconscious. That's how you learn to trust your imagination. And you rely upon that because you know that that's the best way to bring forth your vision. Singleness of purpose is essential for success. No matter what may be one's idea of the definition of success, yet singleness of purpose is a quality which may and generally does call for thought on many allied subjects. By having a definite chief aim, what will happen is you'll start to see how everything in your life is related towards your vision. This exercise that I said of coming up the seven reasons why everything in your life is related to your vision will become easy for you because you'll be able to see the connects assumptions hardens into facts. Now, I, now you know why I brought that up. Because where your attention goes on, if you put your attention on there long enough, that will create different kinds of reference points and links to that, and that will be hardened into fact. What you want hardened into fact and materialized in the external world is your definite chief aim. It should be remembered, however, that the mind requires for its development a variety of exercise, just as the physical body. To be properly developed calls for many forms of systematic exercise. The exercise is to keep your mind on your definite chief aim. To take inventory of the different ways the subconscious mind manifests distraction and resolve it so you can recalibrate the subconscious mind back to the definite chief aim. The exercise is to link everything towards your definite chief aim. The exercise is if when your mind wanders, you pick up the card with your definite chief aim and you read it with absolute conviction and faith to amp up your burning desire to put your attention back on your definite chief aim. The exercise is to stick with your definite chief aim until it has been created no matter what. And then move on to the next one again and again and again. That's how you control your mind. Horses are trained to certain gates by trainers who hurdle jump them over handicaps and cause them to develop the desired steps through habit and repetition. The human mind must also be trained in a similar manner, manner by a variety of thought inspiring stimuli. So what you think about, you will become what you think about is going to be projected in the external world and created and materialized into form and reflected by people, environment and circumstance. That's how it works. So we want to stimulate our mind, which is that with that, which is related towards our definite chief aim. If you surround yourself with people, environment, circumstance, you make a conscious effort and decision to link everything in your life towards your definite chief aim, you are saturating your mind with stimulus to go into your subconscious mind that connects to the superconscious mind to materialize your dreams, gives you insights, perspectives, hunches, inspirations. You do not get this if your mind wanders onto other things. You're gonna get hunches and inspirations related to other things. The goal of life is to materialize your vision. You were created in the image of the creator to create. And so you go forth to practice this very important skill, which is taking control of your mind and your imagination and directing it towards a specific worthwhile objective of your choice.
to reveal to you who you are. And the more you do this, the more you will understand yourself and know yourself, your self-confidence, your faith will go up and your belief in yourself. You will carry yourself that way and you'll be moving on to higher and higher realizations of your vision. Every person should make it his business to gather new ideas from sources other than the environment in which he daily lives and works. The mind becomes withered, stagnant, narrow, and closed unless it searches for new ideas. The farmer should come to the city quite often and walk amongst the strange faces and tall buildings. He will go back to his farm, his mind refreshed. So what is he talking about here in relation to the definite chief aim? When we're saying have a definite chief aim, we're not saying being closed-minded. We're saying you're going to materialize your definite chief aim and everything is contributing towards your definite chief aim. So one of the exercises that I like to do is I like to place myself in different environments, people, circumstances, a variety of them to see how they can teach me to bring forth my definite chief aim. You will learn by stimulating your mind, by placing yourself in environments that others cannot see the connects where you see the connects. Why so? Because this does a handful of things. Number one is it teaches you how everything is related towards your vision because you're going to be able to see the connects. Number two is it trains your mind to be stimulated by the creative thinking of others in a way that doesn't sway you in a different direction but contributes towards your vision. Number three, you'll also develop a bigger, wider, more diverse and deeper pleasing personality because a lot of success is a net result of your service to others. So you'll connect with others. Number four, you will also learn to embrace other people's burning desire and their definite chief aim and work in a spirit of harmony and not be closed-minded. So when we're talking about mind control, the secret is not closed-mindedness. The secret is real power versus force, which is acceptance and understanding of others. doesn't necessarily mean you agree with it, but you accept and understand their point of view that their way of looking at re reality materializes in the external world. And you can also borrow and understand different principles, philosophies, and understandings. That's why I love combining the authors together in these later discussions where I'm looking at Napoleon Hill's perspective and Neville Goddard's perspective and James Allen's perspective, or Nightingale's perspective, because to me, they're all contributing towards my definite chief aim. And one of the things we want to do is be in a state of flow. And one of the ways to stay in flow is to actually be more opening and bracing, is to be very fluid and dynamic and accepting and understanding. So thus, as contrarian as it might seem, sometimes we want to take ourselves and place ourselves in different environments to see how it contributes towards our definite chief aim, to, how it's, to, to realize that it stimulates different creativity, not to sway you away, but to actually bring you back on course and keep you on course in a multidimensional way. Now, this is done by having a definite chief aim and having faith and conviction that your definite chief aim will be brought forth. And from that perspective of honoring that belief that it will be brought forth, when you go into different environments, they will actually contribute towards bringing it forth. Power is organized effort. As has already been stated, success is based upon power. And referring back to the definition of power, we're not talking about the world of Caesar-based power, as Neville Gardot puts it, which is from a place of force. We're talking from a real place of power, which is unconditional love and working in the higher states of consciousness, which is the imagination. Just about every problem in this world can be solved using the imagination, which is the power of God. In the imagination, we can find ways to solve problems that are in the spirit of harmony. Otherwise, would have been thought that the only way to solve the problem was conflict and force if believed that can be found a way to solve to the benefit of all. It will be found in the imagination and brought forth. Now, let's put this all into application into creating the definite chief aim. So this is the process. Suppose you intend to accumulate $120,000 by the 1st of January, once years hence, and you intend to give personal services in return for the money. In the capacity of an entrepreneur, your written statement of purpose should be something similar to as following. By the first day of January 2000 and whatever, I will have in my possession $120,000, which will come to me in various amounts from time to time during the interim. In return for this money, I give the most efficient service of which I am capable, rendering the fullest possible quantity in the best possible quality of service 
in the capacity of entrepreneur, whatever it is that you do. I believe that I will have this money in my possession. My faith is so strong that I can now see this money before my eyes. I can touch it with my hands. It is now awaiting transfer to me at the time and in the proportion that I delivered the service I intend to render in return for it. I'm waiting for a plan by which to accumulate this money, and I will follow this plan when it is received. Then repeat this program or repeat the process night and morning until you can see it in your imagination or follow the process that Neville Goddard outlines, which is to create an imaginary scene and imagine yourself feeling or assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled, the end result of what happens when you accumulate it. And my way of doing it is I keep it on my card and I link multiple areas of my life towards that definite chief aim. So the card is with me all the time. It's a specific definite chief aim, focused, quantifiable, definite chief aim. And I link everything in my life towards that definite chief aim. So when I wake up in the morning, I have affirmations of all the important areas of my life in a way that I value those important areas of my life and I link it to my definite chief aim. So it's linked to my definite chief aim and my definite chief aim is linked to each of those areas. Then if I come across any persistent fears, doubts, or indecision-based thinking, I realize that it's going to express itself in the external world, and I reprogram it using my subconscious mind reprogramming process with audio affirmations that I create. And as a result of that, I repeat that process over and over again till it happens. So he says, third, place a written copy of your statement where you can see it at night and morning and read it before retiring upon rising until it has been memorized. So I keep my definite chief frame with me wherever I go and I pull out and I read it all the time on my coaching and my consulting calls. Just about every call I pull out the definite chief aim and I read it as a reference and also an affirmation. Why? Because it keeps my mind focused on my definite chief aim. Why? Because I have control of my mind in the process and I feel in control of my mind and I see how everything is contributing and relating to my definite chief aim in the spirit of harmony. See, it's not just about me. It's about everybody else that's involved with me. I'm helping them achieve their definite chief aim as well. This is a spirit of harmony. This is why we're here. Remember, as you carry out these instructions, that you are applying the principle of auto-suggestion for the purpose of giving orders to your subconscious mind. Remember also that your subconscious mind will act only upon instructions which are emotionalized and handed over to it with feeling. Faith is the strongest and most productive of the emotions. Follow the instructions given in the chapter of faith. These instructions may at first seem abstract, do not let this disturb you. Again, removing fears, doubts, and indecision because assumptions harden into fact. Follow the instructions no matter how abstract or impractical they may at first appear to be. The time will soon come if you do as you have been instructed in the spirit as well as in act when a whole new universe of power will unfold to you, which is from your imagination. These are imaginary acts, which is the power of God. Skepticism, in connection with all new ideas, is characteristic of all human beings. But if you follow the instructions outlined, your skepticism will soon be replaced by belief, and this in turn will soon become crystallized into absolute faith that you will have arrived at the point where you may truly say, I am the master of my faith, I am the captain of my soul. Captain of your soul. Your vision of your soul is your true identity. And when you realize your true identity, which is your vision, you are captain of your soul. That's what it means. And it is done in your imagination. And it is done through your definite chief aim. And it is done through the reflection and understanding that fears, doubts, and indecisions are elements that need to be removed because the external world is a projection of the inner world. And whatever you believe in reality will materialize into form. So if you've got fears and doubts and indecisions about your definite chief aim, then the goal is to remove those because they are standing in your way. They are preventing the subconscious mind from bringing forth your vision. Your subconscious mind has access to the superconscious mind and all this stuff, you don't even have to think about how it works. You don't need to know how it works. It will be brought forth when you remove the fears, doubts, and indecision. Why? Because the fears, doubts, and indecision will materialize if they're in your, if your mind. So by removing them, they're gone. They're out of the equation. This world is a reflection of what is within, like a hologram. So as you go about, when you've created your definite chief aim, when you live in your imagination, remember the seven different whys. And always remember this. All is actually one mind individualized as you and me. We are all one and individuals. 
We are one and we are all individuals. When you operate in the spirit of harmony, you are saying to the universal mind or super consciousness, I operate in the spirit of harmony and bring forth those that are also in the spirit of harmony and people will be brought forth. Environment will be brought forth. Circumstance will be brought forth to bring forth your vision. And if you have fears, doubts, and indecision so, uh, surrounding that, you have to remove it because if you don't, you don't have control of your mind. That's a net result of limited thinking that is not you. It is not your true identity, which is your vision, which is from a place of abundance. So to control your mind, you have to remove fears, doubts, and indecision and harmonize with your vision. That's how you have control of your mind. And then you won't be distracted. That's how you remain focused. Because you'll be surrounded by that what is related to your vision. And then you will value both the destination and the journey. That's why I made that video last week on having the burning desire plus detachment of outcome. That's called unconditional love. Unconditional love is the burning desire and detachment from outcome, all in one. Everything is and isn't at the same time. All is one, embracing both polarities, both sides. So let's talk about some James Allen quotes that I got from As a Man Think It to really infuse this in. The aphorism, as a man think it in his heart, so is he, not only embraces the whole of a man's being, but is so comprehensive as to reach out to every condition and circumstance of his life. A man is literally what he thinks, his character being a complete sum of his thoughts. The character is the complete sum of the thoughts, and we need to remove the programming within that reflects outwards that is not in alignment with the true identity, which is the vision. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, is the heart is also referred to as the imagination, which is God. So as you think in your heart, so you become. And what do you think in your heart? As a being of power, intelligence, and love, and the Lord of his own thoughts, man holds the key to every situation and contains within himself that transforming and regenerative agency by which he may make himself what he wills. So you have to have the will. The, the conscious mind is the guardian of the subconscious mind. The conscious mind has to sit there and write the definite chief aim. That's what you're encouraged to do right now, is to write your definite chief aim. Commit to yourself that you're going to write your definite chief aim and stick with it till it is brought forth. That's the conscious mind's responsibility. Write it down. And that right there is the will. You write it down, you give the instruction to the subconscious mind, and you allow the subconscious mind through faith, by believing with faith. And the subconscious mind will do its thing with the superconscious mind. You don't even know this. We, we have not even figured out how to explain how the superconscious and the subconscious mind works. It's unreasonable to assume. I've not seen any data that fully grasps how the superconscious and the subconscious mind works. We don't, that's the beautiful thing. We don't need to. That's called faith. We allow it to work. The mind of God has its way of working. You don't have to know how the sixth sense work. It does work. Man's mind may be likened to a garden, which may be intelligently cultivated or allowed to run wild. But whatever cultivated or neglected, it will and must bring forth. If no useful seeds are put into it, then abundance of useless weed seeds will fall therein and will continue to produce their kind. So if you don't control your mind, and if you don't follow this process, then you allow the weed seeds of other people's thinking, which not serve you, to fall into your mind and bear fruit. And it might not be the fruit that you desire. So you have a choice. You take the power back in your hands. You connect with your vision, which is your true purpose to be here. It is your main purpose to be here. That is how to live in the spirit of harmony, by living through your vision and helping others also live through their vision. And it's done by con controlling and redirecting, not from a place of force, none of this stuff is force, but from a place of embrace. Because that's how the subconscious mind is encouraged, not through force. Because if you put force in the subconscious mind, you'll experience force in the external world. You are simply to focus on your vision with calm faith, keep your mind on your definite chief aim, link every area of your life with calm faith, stay in flow because flow stimulates the subconscious mind in the right way. And when you do that, no useless weed seeds can fall and continue to produce their kind. Just as a gardener cultivates his plot, keeping it free from weeds and growing the flowers and fruits which he requires, so may a man tend the garden of his mind, weeding out 
all the wrong, useless, and impure thoughts, and cultivating towards perfection the flowers and fruits of right, useful, and pure thoughts. By pursuing this process, a man sooner or later discovers that he is the master gardener of his soul, the director of his life. He also reveals within himself the laws of thought and understands the ever-increasing accuracy, with ever-increasing accuracy, how the thought forces and mind elements operate in shaping of his character, circumstances, and mind. All is mind. We said this in the Kabbalion. All is mind. Once you control the mind, you control existence. So by following this process, you will understand the laws of thought and with ever-increasing accuracy, accuracy, how the thought forces and mind elements operate in shaping the character, circumstance, and destiny. The universe does not favor the greedy, the dishonest, the vicious, although on the mere surface it may sometimes appear to do so. It helps the honest, the magnanimous, the virtuous. All the great teachers of ages have declared this in varying forms, and to prove this, and you have to prove it to yourself and know it, a man must but to persist in making himself more and more virtuous by lifting up your thoughts. When the impure thoughts show up, you can reprogram those thoughts and you have to lift up the thoughts. You can always see what you're going to create in the external world based by the thoughts that you have prior to it. And your goal is to lift up the thoughts. The dreamers are the saviors of the world. As the visible world is sustained by the invisible, we're talking about invisible stuff here. So men, through all their trials and sins and sordid vocations, are nourished by the beautiful visions of their solitary dreamers. Humanity cannot forget its dreamers. It cannot let their ideals fade or die. It lives in them. It knows them as realities which shall one day see and know. All that we experience that is beautiful, pure, enjoyable, abundant, happiness came as a result of other people realizing their visions in which they created a space where we can do the same. The greatest achievement was at first and for a time a dream. The oak sleeps in the acorn. The, bay, uh, the bird waits in the egg. And in the highest vision of the soul, a waking angel stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. See, dreams, your vision, is the seedling of your reality, if you follow this process. If you keep your mind to what is related to your vision. If you realize that the power is in your imagination. If you realize that you keep your mind focused on your definite chief aim by realizing that everything is related and you keep your attention and you understand and you really know why everything is related towards your vision and you keep yourself in a state of flow, then you bring forth your vision. This is the process. And it's to be repeated after you accomplish one goal to keep your mind and create another definite chief aim. I'll speak from experience in this. Every time I have had a definite chief aim in my life, I was the most focused, I was the most fun, I was the most flowing, I was the most driven, I was the most motivated, I felt the most alive, I was physically, mentally, and emotionally full of well-being, excitement, and any time I did not have a definite chief aim, I did not feel that way. I was feeling the opposite. I was feeling myself withering away. It's important to have a definite chief aim. Cherish your visions. Your vision is your real identity. It is who you were to materialize and be on this world. It is who you really are. Your true identity is your vision. It may or may not be the identity that was given to you by the external world, five sensory based stimulus and the meaning. A lot of times it's not, which is why I believe it's part of the game of life to identify your vision and create your vision. Cherish your visions, cherish your ideals, cherish the music that stirs in your heart the beauty that forms in your mind, the loveliness that drapes your purest thoughts, for out of them will grow all delight conditions, all heavenly environment. Of these, if you but remain true to them, your world will at last be built. If you want to copy this mind map, the link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.